Great. I'll set this way. So. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to get started. Um, uh, although the, the people from the previous panel had had obviously such a great time and full of such great energy. I don't want to chase them out, but, uh, but we'll have to get our started because under time constraints. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> oh, and, oh, and one of them is going to stay on. Claire is going to stay Yeah. Marie Claire is going to stay on. My name is David Ainsworth. I'm the head of communications for the Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And it's my real pleasure to moderate this side event on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Uh, we'll be talking about enhancing action on climate and implementation of the sustainable development goals. Um, we now know uh, within the CBD process, this was very obvious to us, but now seeing the climate process being expressed is exciting. Biodiversity is at the center of the biggest issues the world faces, from climate change to poverty eradication, food and water security, health and sustainable development. Now, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that's currently being negotiated under the auspices of the Convention on Biological Diversity and set for adoption at COP15 in Montreal, Canada uh, in just a few weeks, it sets out to bring a transformation in society's relationship with nature to ensure that the contributions biodiversity makes to our well-being and to everything are recognized by all. The framework that's under negotiation presents a historic opportunity to introduce a global agreement that can enhance action, not just on nature, but also on climate, and also advance the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And it can do so in an inclusive, participatory, and gender-responsive manner. The framework's intended to be used not only to the Convention on Biological Diversity, but also by the broader international community. So in the event today, we've assembled an um, uh, uh, extensive panel that brings together people involved in the different uh, Rio conventions, people involved in the United Nations system, the co-chairs themselves who are negotiating this uh, as well. And we're going to look at uh, ways to explore synergies and discuss how these different processes and parts of the UN system can support implementation of the framework. And we hope to have an exchange of ideas on the development of coordinated approaches to implementing commitments under multiple goals. So again, we'll be looking at this, looking at how can we support climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, in the work under the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, accelerate progress in the NDGs, um, uh, and look at all inclusion of all stakeholders. The event's going to take the form of a moderated fireside chat, so all the speakers here will have an opportunity to comment, to speak, and then we will also invite you from the floor to raise some questions as well. So I have three questions here, but I'm not going to introduce them just yet. I'll just introduce the panelists, and then uh, the panelists, you, you should be ready at any time because I could ask any one of you these questions, so you should be ready for it. But first, let me introduce our distinguished group of panelists. I'm very excited to have all these people on board. So immediately to my left is uh, my boss, uh, Elizabeth Maruma Emrema, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Beside her is Susan Gardner, who directs the Ecosystems Division of the United Nations Environment Program uh, in Nairobi. Uh, beside Susan, we have, uh, first of all, Mr. Francis Ogwal, who's one of the co-chairs of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Frameworks Working Group, and he's from the Government of Uganda. Uh, his uh, partner uh, and twin is Basil Van Havre, uh, another co-chair from the Government of Canada. Uh, beside the co-chairs, we have Maria Elena Semedo, who is the Deputy Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, joining us from the United Nations Convention uh, to Combat Desertification is Louise Baker, uh, who works with the Global Mechanism under the UNCCD. And representing the United Nations Framework Convention to Combat Climate Change is Mr. Donald Cooper, who is the Director of Transparency uh, and the Secretariat there. So these are our panelists who will be put on the spot today to talk about some of these questions moving forward. So, okay, so I'll introduce the first question and panelists uh, will we'll, we'll see how we can work through. When you respond, I'm going to ask you to respond fairly succinctly, probably just a couple of minutes, three minutes max, so we can get through everyone because we have a lot of, a lot of people uh, to cover here. So the first question that is before you is the following. So we know that climate change and biodiversity loss are joint crises that are becoming increasingly evident and increasingly devastating. As addressing these synergistically is therefore essential and urgent. As we saw last year in Glasgow, world leaders are now recognizing more and ever the importance of nature for addressing climate change and human well-being. 
So the question that I'll be putting to you is how do we make sure that the momentum generated over this last year and even now continues on? And what actions or approaches could help enhance action on climate, biodiversity, and the SDGs? And so I'm going to first actually uh, ask Elizabeth uh, to do the first part of this. Thank you. Good afternoon, all dear colleagues and my dear panelists uh, here. Going straight to the question uh, is basically one, the links between climate change and biodiversity loss. And what I will say at the beginning is the timing of the climate COP here and the timing of the CBD or biodiversity COP in December, one after the other. Many of the discussions we hear going on here in the last two weeks have biodiversity nature agenda within the context. Yesterday, for instance, we had a full day discussing different issues of the connection between climate change and biodiversity. Delighted that now the climate community has and is recognizing the links and the inseparable connection between climate change and biodiversity. Because it was only last year climate COP for the first time in the climate negotiation that biodiversity nature was on the table or discussed. And this time, under the Egyptian presidents, even further increased. And we hope that these outcomes from here will smoothly transition and lead to the further uh, discussions in, uh, in Montreal. So that's one. Two, it is now very clear that challenges being faced for climate change and biodiversity loss are typically the same. And therefore, solutions to climate change cannot be looked in silo without looking simultaneously at the same time with ch I mean, solutions for biodiversity. Each is dependent on the other. 30% of climate mitigation is expected to come from biodiversity conservation and protection. So without biodiversity, we can say everything and do everything on climate, we will not reach the 1.5 degrees. So that's a clear message that the two are inseparable and need to be looked at together. Not surprising that one of the major discussions is nature-based solutions for climate change. So clearly, climate community realizing solutions to climate change are on the ecosystem, on biodiversity, on nature. Again, indicating the connection between the two. And clearly, without dealing with climate change and without dealing climate change, which is one of the direct drivers of loss of biodiversity, we will not achieve the uh, sustainable development goals. Analysts even have told us 14 of the 17 SDGs will be also dependent on the contribution from the biodiversity angle. And wherever biodiversity then contributes, it means also climate change comes at hand. So again, the three, once again, dependent on each other or one on the other. To be able to achieve the SDGs, we need the warming in climate improved, we need the direct drivers, and also indirect, direct to be dealt with. And therefore, all, if we succeed in the two, then we'll succeed in a number of SDGs. And we should not look at SDGs, only 15, uh, the one on land, or 13 on ocean, or just the one on climate change. Because when you look at poverty, gender, sanitation, consumption and production, and several others of the SDGs do connect both to climate uh, contribution and biodiversity. I see my boss looking at me, which means I need to stop. Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for the next thing for you to, to, to say, Elizabeth. 
Thank, thank you very much for that. So we are at a climate cop, and one of the things we're talking about is the momentum that has been generated and accelerated from Glasgow onto here. So now I'm going to turn to, to Donald Cooper um, from the UNFCCC and have him talk a little bit of what are some of the ways that we can look at continuing this momentum from last year, uh, you know, taking the, the climate process into account. Uh, thank you very much. One of the things that the world has come to realize over the last five, eight years is that climate is not a thing. Um, it is everything. It's your health care, school system, fashion, cars, energy, everything. It requires every single bit of every single effort to be successful. One of those key areas is biodiversity. And it is not necessary to look at taking action on biodiversity or taking action on climate. It is taking action. For example, one of the things the parties have done is agreed on Red Plus. It's a results-based payment for countries maintaining their forests, looking after them and keeping them in the condition that they are and enhancing them. And the climate process recognizes this as a valuable carbon sink and therefore pays these countries to do so. About 130 developing countries have put forward these plans for massive maintenance of their forests. Of course, they are looking for the financial reward as well as maintaining the forests. But of course, maintaining the forest also means that they are maintaining their biodiversity. Many countries, and we have just seen the Bahamas in the Caribbean announce that they will be putting their blue carbon on the uh, stock exchange in New York, the bonds. What that means is that they are agreeing that they will maintain their entire offshore systems as they are as carbon sinks. And they will be paid in order to maintain that. Yes, it's a carbon sink, but it is also means that they're going to preserve all of their biodiversity, and many countries are going to follow suit. So when we look at biodiversity and climate change, it is difficult to say, I am doing this for biodiversity or I'm doing this for climate change. The actions have benefits across the board, and this is a valuable thing that we're beginning to realize, and even more valuable is that we're beginning to realize that the economic development of the country is the biggest gain, even though they may have taken that action for biodiversity maintenance or climate change. And I think this is a potential for the future for huge returns. Great, thank you very, very much. Now, we're here at the Climate COP, but one of the things that we at the CBD do, do in work in terms of close synergies, we also work with the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Together with the UNFCCC, we call ourselves the Rio Conventions, born out of 1992. So I'm going to turn to Louise now. And so, Louise, in terms of you know, momentum generated, we also saw this coming out of your COP that you had in, in Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire earlier this year. Can you talk a bit about how under the UNCCD this momentum can also be captured? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm Louise Baker. I'm the managing director of the global mechanism of UNCCD. So we're the kind of, not implementing, but trying to be a bit more operational arm of UNCCD. And um, I totally agree. It's, it's very definitely at the kind of, at that implementation uh, coal face, to use a terrible term, um, where, where we're really seeing progress. The farmer is p taking the action on the ground, the smallholder is taking the action on the ground, not for climate, not for biodiversity, but and not even for the, for the health and productivity of his land, but for his own survival. So yeah, from our side, we think that uh, land has obviously an important role to play in both the climate change mitigation and adaptation space, and, in, and also in terms of protecting biodiversity. A third of biodiversity actually you find in the soil. Um, so we think that as a sort of operative kind of um, space for action, land brings, and the maintenance of land brings simultaneously benefits. There are a 
about so far a billion hectares um, pledged for conservation, sustainable management and restoration. 50% of that currently under UNCCD kind of targets, land degradation neutrality. I think we see that if the global biodiversity framework is adopted, which it will be, it will be. Um, then we would hope that there would be um, more commitments in this space and that we can learn from the experience of land degradation neutrality. We're using quite a lot of ge um, geospatial data um, and quite a lot of support to the countries in terms of practical design of projects and programs to scale up. Um, the kind of momentum really is building in this area. We were, we're now the hosts of a G20 initiative on land, um, which is, we hope, encouraging G20 countries that have, have looked at our convention historically and said, oh, that's for poor countries, and now really taking this land agenda seriously and engaging on it. And we saw here at this COP the Middle East Greening Initiative also launched, which will hopefully bring a new dynamic in the Middle East region. I'm going to close just by saying what Ibrahim kind of always, it's his kind of go-to phrase for this conversation, but it really resonates. We cannot solve the climate crisis today, fix land and soil tomorrow, and wait for bio, the, dealing with the biodiversity emergency the day after that. These all have to be done together, and you can really see the kind of, these narratives resonating through each of the processes now, and we've just got to deliver on it, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much, Louise. So looking at these, these other acceleration moving across all the areas, and I, I loved you reminding us that, was it, did you say 30% of biodiversity is located in the soil? Um, very important. Let's, let's widen the circle of the conversation a little bit now. I'm going to turn to um, uh, Maria Elena Semedo of FAO, because we were talking about soil as well in a minute. Can you talk a little bit about um, how the momentum can be generated or continued or enhanced by actions uh, with FAO, please? Thank you. Uh, we have already, you can hear me, uh, to, uh, refer about the linking, linkages between the climate and biodiversity, how they are interlinked and how one will affect the other. But I will be bringing another perspective, is the perspective of the food security. Today or this week, it uh, has been announced that the world reached 8 billion people. How are we going to feed this population sustainably and in a way that they have healthy diets? Healthy diets means diversity in our diet. If we don't preserve or we don't conserve our biodiversity, if it's destroyed by climate change, we cannot feed a population and we cannot have a diversity in our diet. I'm talking about terrestrial or aquatic foods and this is how is really important for us is how we link the food systems transformation to climate and to biodiversity how transforming our agri-food system we can make biodiversity more productive in order that we can reach this equation and i think the first way is how work in an integrated manner how we can have a systemic approach that we look at the production, the transformation, and the consumption together. How we work across all sectors, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, environment, climate change. And if you have an integrated approach, we have an example on land restoration. We work on the NDK on ecosystem restoration. We restore land for production. We can have healthy lands, we can produce, and we can achieve the SDGs eradicate poverty and livelihoods, and we can conserve our biodiversity. That we cannot separate the agendas, we need to have an integrated agenda, and we need to work in a systemic approach, and to, to have a productive biodiversity for agri-food systems. 
Thank you very, very much. I mean, your mention of food systems, we've had that dialogue in terms over the last couple of years now of really moving forward on looking at the entire food system and what it means for all of these areas. So thank you very much for mentioning that. And also you mentioned the decade on ecosystem restoration, which is another important momentum for a lot of us in the processes. So I'm going to now turn to, uh, to Susan Gardner. So Susan, with UNEP, you know, you work in so many different areas. There are areas of advocacy, but you touch so many other issues that relate to the environment and the SDGs as well. What can we see in the area of, of, of synergies with the UNEP's work? Well, it, one thing we know for sure is that the only way we're really going to achieve the full potential of all the multiple co-benefits that we can get from actions on nature is going to be through working across the UN system, combining all the different mandates that we see from different UN agencies. Um, hearing from Maria Elena about uh, food and the follow-up from the Secretary General's uh, UN uh, Food System Summit is a great example where, you know, with under FAO's leadership, all of the different agencies have come together and are working through country teams to ensure that we are responding to what countries have put forward as their priorities for their national pathways. So I think that's one really good example of how we do that. Yesterday in Biodiversity Day, as we saw the secretariats of the MEAs, as we saw uh, various agencies coming forward, showing that clear understanding of the connection to their work with biodiversity and the interconnections among all of us. Um, and I'm really pleased with what I was hearing from Elizabeth as well, just this is now the conversation. This isn't a side conversation anymore. This is the conversation. It's really, really fantastic to see. Uh, you know, we have the, um, the UN Common Approach was designed as part of an understanding of how important it is for us to coordinate across the UN system. And so this has been something that really allows the whole UN system to work together to support member states in implementing the post-2020 framework and aligning it with the 2030 Agenda, aligning it with the Paris Agreement, aligning it with land degradation goals. Um, so we can see that these systems are in place, that they are they're real, and that they're based on serious structures to make this happen. I think, though, when we're talking about really mobilizing action quickly, and you know, we, all, we hear it almost every day, this COP is a COP for implementation. We've heard the pledges. We've heard the intentions. We've heard the commitments. We need the action. And for the action, we need the resources. And so coordinating also across the UN system in terms of how we help to ensure that we've got good, strong approaches to mobilize resources and to act based on available financial and technical support for the framework is also a really important part of ensuring that we're all working together as one system. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, Susan. And uh, yes, rem reminding us of the... Um uh, yeah, the importance of an overall systemic and the one UN approach. Indeed, the Environment Management Group brings together a lot of you together under this issue as well. So for this last question, or for this question here, I'm now going to give the co-chairs the chance to, to respond. In fact, you get a bit of a bonus because there's two of you. You get a little more time than everyone else. But so with regard to this first question, what we've heard from some of the panelists, can you tell us how the framework supports, enhances, reflects some of these ideas that they've expressed in the ways moving forward? Maybe I can start. One of the, one of the key features of the framework that is being discussed is a more robust planning, reporting, and review system. So um, that's a way not only to, to see if we're making a difference and be able to show if we're, when we're making a difference, but also to, to see how the actions are being done. So there will be uh, a willingness on the part of the, the parties to enter very quickly in action and a, uh, a system that would be designed to show that. Uh, we don't have, and an, an one part of that system is gonna be to see how the ambition of each uh, party is adding up to global targets. And, and, and if need be, how that can be um, adapted. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is also to, to ensure that we, from the get-go, have all the elements that are needed for implementation. So it is not about agreeing to ambition now and uh, agreeing to resource later. We're going to have to have the package together, the three elements, ambition, resources, 
the transparency and, and responsibility system together. Over to you, Francis. Yeah, um, to add on to what the coach has just said, something I will have to bear in mind that the framework actually addresses all these issues we are discussing here. If you talk about food system, there's a provision within the framework. If you talk about um, climate, there's a whole target on that. You are talking about uh, to do with the species. You are talking about all these other topics that broadly touches on biodiversity. They are all there in that framework. And that, that framework is one framework that is so overarching that if we can understand it, if we can implement it, surely the framework gives us one opportunity to address climate change impact, especially through adaptation. And we shouldn't miss that opportunity for sure. Look at target eight, clearly coming out to spell out the contribution of biodiversity to adaptation and mitigation to climate change. So is the other on food systems. So is the other on benefits to clean water, green cities, name it. Biodiversity has all this opportunity it gives, but I think we are missing the opportunity if we don't really look at that opportunity that comes very clearly and is there. All we need to do is protect the ecosystem, ensure that it is sustainably used, ensure that we restore, ensure that we value them, and really nature will continue to give us these services. After all, for all these years, what has cushioned us most from the impacts of climate change? I think biodiversity has offered us a very, very big service on that. And that is something we need to build on. We don't need to lose more of the services that we're already losing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, yeah, so Francis, you've reminded us that given that there's so many targets and that they really cut across a lot of different issues, there are opportunities under each of them for engagement of each and every one of the actors on the stage and many other organizations who aren't represented on the panel as well. Um, so. Basil also mentioned the question of implementation, so with apologies to the panel, I'm going to jump ahead to the third question rather than the second question and talk about that a little bit because it talks about implementation. So first of all, um, when the Aichi biodiversity targets uh, were created and they came to a close in 2020, one of the questions that came forward is how fast were these implemented and indeed it was the lack of speed of implementation which was a question. So the Global Biodiversity Framework is meant to address that, uh, plus we're also facing a delay of, of a couple of years due to the pandemic conditions. So given this need for speedy implementation for, as a condition for success, and given the delays, I'm going to ask the panelists, um, how can the entities here um, support the need for speedy early action? Um, and how will you all engage in cross-agency collaboration for this early action? Uh, and the other part we'll talk about too is a little bit about communications and advocacy. So I will start again with Elizabeth. So why don't you talk a little bit about early implementation? Thank you very much indeed. Having a framework is one. It will just be a paper, a document, unless we move it from document, from our tables and shelves, into on the ground action, then business as usual will continue. And it is important that this time learning from past some of the reasons of the failures to achieve and meet the H biodiversity targets, the previous one of the previous decade, one of the reasons was delayed in the start of implementation. Because many countries began with the development, updating and reviewing of national biodiversity strategies and action plan, a consultative process at national level which takes, which for many took three, four years. Meaning in actual fact, we didn't have a full decade of implementation. We hope this time we can avoid that uh, so that implementation can happen straight and there are ways to do so. Over 170 countries already under the, in the last decade have already updated their national biodiversity strategies and action plan. And the framework is building upon the Aichi biodiversity targets. And therefore what we, the uh, abbreviated NBSAPs already in place are useful to continue implementation using the same, probably then update as implementation continues. One, two, 
delighted that a global environmental facility in partnership with UN Environment Program and UN Development Program uh, already is collaborating with a number of countries in need of support to prepare for immediate start of implementation once the framework uh, is in place. So a number of countries have already indicated their need. Project proposals have been submitted, approved, and just waiting to start. So if all this happens, we hope then implementation will start. The other reason uh, where we could not reach the targets is that although one of the targets of the Aichi Biodiversity Target 20 uh, <coughs> expected for doubling of international financial flows as well as uh, ODA, Overseas Development uh, Resources, yes, international flow funding resources doubled but was still inadequate to meet the biodiversity challenges and therefore was not enough to uh, fully implement the requirements uh, of the different targets. We have seen quite a number of already pronouncements, pledges of increasing financial resources. European Union is doubling its financial res uh, resources on biodiversity. Uh, Germany has doubled and in addition added 1.5 uh, billion euros uh, for the next years to 2025. We're afraid of climate finance percentage, UK 30% going to biodiversity. We've heard philanthropies also putting money to immediately support uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. So we hope this already availability of resources, and if already available now and not tomorrow, day after tomorrow, will all help to support implementation to begin immediately and therefore not lose time for implementation. Thank you. So yes, it's, it, it, that project that Elizabeth cited is an important early action program for implementation. It cuts across many countries, money has already been dispersed, and actions are moving forward. So I'm going to now move on to, uh, to Susan Gardner of UNEP to talk about how can UNEP help support both this question of early effective action cross-agency collaboration and the communications and advocacy part. So it's a, it's a big ask for you, Susan. What well, is, and a lot of, you know, a lot of it just relates to what I've said before in terms of working with other agencies. And what we found in the UN system is that when we're working together, when we're working across our different mandates, we're all more powerful. And so we found that in relationships with FAO on the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, with WHO, FAO, OIE on One Health, with UNDP on UN Red. All of these are places where when we work closely together with other agencies, we can ensure that there's the power of the agency and their work is including uh, the environmental lens and the environmental perspective. We've had more collaboration just recently with WFP as they've realized the importance of an environmentally sustainable operation as part of delivering the best humanitarian service for the countries where they're providing that. So it's you know it's hard to say more than what we've just heard from Elizabeth in terms of one of the way we do that is aligning finance with these various objectives. So making sure that finance that goes towards, for example, uh, humanitarian aid and, and uh, food also is understanding the larger mandates in terms of the needs to help support member states in adaptation and building resilience in helping to develop uh, restoration pathways that actually will make them have better food security, better health, uh, better population well-being uh, moving forward in the future. We also are uh, consistently ensuring that wherever you hear UNEP's voice, you will always hear as well the, the call for doing this in, with just transition, ensuring that the gender perspective is, is incorporated, ensuring that we have brought youth to the conversation in a way that's meaningful, in a way that they uh, have uh, some power in being stewards of their future. You know, the, the gap that we have right now for sustainable development is about a little bit more than $4 trillion for the sustainable development goals. It includes all the different targets for the Rio conventions. And so the best thing we can do 
is ensure that we're continuing to bring everyone together around understanding the magnitude of that task and the need for action now. Great. Thanks very much, Susan. Four trillion dollars. That's uh, that's that's a lot of money. But I know we've but under the, the Global Biodiversity Framework, ways of mobilizing more resources beyond just asking from the parties, but looking at things like subsidy reform that can make a difference, but thinking about something that's, that's going to require more action further. Um, Maria Elena Semela, we'll turn to you now in terms of what we can look at under FAO. I mean, you've got a, this great question of a whole variety of stakeholders you can bring in in mobilization. How will FAO respond to this need for speedy implementation? Look. <clears throat> If, if, if you look at the several of the targets, food security or food systems are there, meaning that FAO is be fully committed and involved in the implementation of the framework. How we do it, I think some, the Suzanne, Elizabeth have already referred, how we work together in different UN uh, initiatives or the quadripartite, just to refer the collaborative partnership on turning the tide of deforestation. Deforestation is also an important part. But FAO is a technical organization. We have our standards, the guidelines, the monitoring tools, because it's important, data, statistics to monitor, and how we can help the countries to have the appropriate policies and instruments. And we have our global a biodiversity strategy which will help us to support the countries and implementing their national biodiversity strategies and actions plan. But just to say that FAO also has the convenient power to bring all the actors together. We are talking about UN, but we are talking about the foresters. We are talking about the fishermen. We are talking about the indigenous people. They should all be brought to this discussion and be part of the solution. And FAO, by the network we have at country level, the way we cover and we reach them, we can have bring this platform together to bring all the actors. The last point is regarding financing. You talk about trillions. We work already with the Green Climate Fund, with the Global Environment Facility, the Adaptation Fund, our bilateral uh, partners. We are here to continue to advocate for additional resources to the new 2020 framework. I would like to excuse myself. I have another event now I need to run. Unfortunately, this is our life this week, but it has been a great pleasure and count on FAO. We are fully involved. See you in, uh, in Montreal very soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And I know we'll see you in Montreal as we've seen you engage with the process the whole time. Uh, great to know that you're part of this effort to mobilize resources and your broad stakeholder engagement. Very, very fabulous to be part of the way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. So now I'm going to turn to, uh, to Louise Baker of the UNCCD to talk a little bit about how the work you're doing there can help move on implementation. I mean, we've had some people already mention the United Nations Decade for Ecosystem Rep uh, Restoration, which is restoration is an important part of this as well. But how does some of the other work that you're doing for other parts of, of LDN and things like that could be moved forward? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to try and be quite practical, I guess. Um, from, from the GM side, from the global mechanism side, we're working directly with countries on actually trying to turn their, I, I think we've had quite a bit of experience with the target setting and, and how it's a nice idea, but we really need to turn it into implementation plans really very quickly. So in our process, we'll be looking at land degradation neutrality 2.0. And I think we'd, we'd look to try to work with all of our colleagues to ensure that both biodiversity and climate um, issues are, are better embedded in that. But this is very much looking at land use planning and practical where, geospatially where conservation, sustainable management and restoration is taking place so that we can better monitor it and track it and, and plan for project development. And that's really where I think we uh, have a bit of a, a, a well we have a we, we're certainly trying to have an advantage is in this developing of a pipeline of bankable projects we are providing support to partners to help um, create projects with us that really look at integrating all three climate biodiversity and land issues as part of a sort of integrated approach um, the this I think is part of maybe the work that you've seen that we've been doing in the Great Green Wall in the Sahel 
um, and it, we are seeing real momentum working not just at national level now but also at multilateral project level and at kind of river basin level or um, conservation area level so that we can develop innovative approaches to, to financing. Um, and, and this combines, I think, the, cons the conservation piece, the sustainable management piece, and the restoration piece. Again, none of these can be done in isolation. A couple of final points, maybe, that we're working on some quite interesting innovative financing around debt. And I think developing the KPIs for debt for nature and debt for, for climate and debt for land and getting some sort of agreement on those would be a really useful way of pushing that agenda. In the same way, working quite a lot on value chain development with the private sector and trying to look at the environmental and social safeguards aspects of that and ensuring the sort of key performance indicators there. One final piece um, for us that I think is, um, is the enabling environment. And I think this is where I, I probably would pan that back to the, to the governments and to the civil society. F for us, the particular issue is, is access to land and tenure issues and governance of natural resources. I think that's a rate limiting step to moving quickly. And I, I think I'd like to put that back on the agenda as well, that we, we, we have to focus on that piece too. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Louise. Thank you for those very, very practical ways of moving forward. Yes, the question of some of the key performance indicators we need to, to look at moving forward, and I certainly know that the framework will be looking at some of these matters. Maybe the co-chairs can look at how we're dealing with implementation and those monitoring uh, matters as well. Uh, and it's great to see the efforts that the Global Mechanism has already done now to mobilize financing in a lot of different areas, uh, uh, looking at different kind of private sector actors and other, other stakeholders. And indeed, yes, we should just keep in mind, we'll talk about stakeholders more later on, but yes, some of these fundamental questions about land tenure at the, and actions at the national level that can make a difference for sure. Um, we're going to turn now to, to, to Donald. So, you know, you've got the benefit, Donald, that you do this process every year. So there's a chance to course correct and move and change things forward. So how can under the climate process us work at this kind of accelerating and move quickly on some of these aspects? Oops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, indeed, uh, one thing can give a good example. At this COP, uh, about four days ago, I was told there are 66,000 registered participants. It's probably higher now. Um, there are organizers and security and so on. Um, maybe 8,000 of them are country negotiators. But all the rest are doing something else. And the majority of those concentrate on some form of action linked to implementation. As we move from year to year, that implementation component gets bigger and bigger. And the possibilities that they see get bigger and bigger. We are negotiating hard to maximize the amount of funds in the Green Climate Fund and replen replenishments in the GEF, but they are dwarfed by the funding that gets discussed just here during the course of those two weeks. And that's only two weeks out of the entire year. So the availability of the opportunity, the availability of the resources, the availability of the players um, is not really the issue. What has been difficult is what do they get together on? Many have been arguing that they should be at the table. We should be at the big people table. Now, many of them are at the big people's table. And their argument is still, we should be at the big people's table. You are there. What do you want to do with the opportunity? And I think um, this is not finances or changing the uh, uh, international development banks. This is about identifying what works. Right? And we are now beginning to see more and more countries realizing that they do not have the things that they can act on when people say, let's act. I was sitting in a meeting with a lot of the um, 
donor countries and multilateral development banks. And one of the suggestions was to take all of the developing countries who were LDCs and SIDS and give them every single project they asked for in their nationally determined contribution to remove them from the process of suffering from climate change. It was a realistic number. And it, ironically, was suggested by one of the big banks. But when it was put to the countries, they turned it down. Because they said those documents were not representative of what they really needed. So the question came, what do you really need? If someone is offering you whatever it is, and you do not have an answer. So we are strongly encouraging that at meetings like these COPs or when you engage, is to come with, even if it's a 30% developed plan, uh, that allows people to buy into it. In addition, we strongly encourage that you bring on board people whose expertise already exists in that area. Whenever the UNFCCC deals with agriculture, forests, food, um, we go to FAO because they have that expertise. Whenever we are developing outreach and engagement processes on uh, monitoring and management of systems, we go to UNDP. They have a huge network. Right? So we don't have to negotiate to set up an agreement to do that. They already do that. So it is to take advantage of what exists within the UN entities and take advantage of their expertise. I think I've taken advantage of your time a lot, so I'll stop there. No, there's no need to stop. To, to, to stop. It's, it's great to hear that this, this focus on, right, where can we identify the resources? Where can things move forward? Uh, and then again, the, the idea of tapping into this network to look for available expertise. So again, it's almost the part of the formula here. I'm going to turn to the co-chairs now. And so your chance to, to identify this question of speedy action, implementation, collaboration, what does the framework do to bring this about? Earlier, we talked about this framework being a framework for all. And, and if, we want, if we want action to start quickly, we have to have a framework that all can understand. And, and uh, we, me first, we have a tendency to, uh, during the course of negotiation, to revert to jargon, complex way of formulating things that accommodate everybody, but everybody in the room. So it is a challenge to come out with a, a document that is simple, that is straightforward to understand and can be readily accessed by, by all. Um, there has been discussion about uh, having, once we're done with the document itself, to have companion documents that, that translate that into the, the wording and the language of a uh, various sector. Having an ocean view of the, the GBF, having an agri-food perspective on the GBF. So what we can do to speed up action is, is having as clear a, a document as possible and then continue to work with stakeholders, with civil society and other sectors to ensure that whatever companion document that is needed is there to, to facilitate and, and to engage everybody. Um, there will be <coughs> a period after the uh, agreement where um, there will be intense work in terms of socializing that uh, document and, and making sure it is understood by all. And definitely, Francis and I feel this is a very important task. Francis? Yeah, thank you, Co-Chair. Just to add a little bit on what we could do at the national level. You see, the framework being adopted is now the major, major task that we have. We are all thinking, when is the framework going to be adopted? Hopefully, December 19th or thereabout, that we gavel and it's there adopted. So what next? Do we all go back and say, this is it, we've been waiting for this framework to be adopted. No, implementation will be so challenging. But one of the things that we also need to do is actually at the national level to unpack, to make this uh, framework much clearer to everybody at the national level. You are talking about sub-national governments, you are talking about private sector, you are talking about business. Different stakeholders are there who have not 
and may not have had the opportunity to come and even listen to these discussions. But there, they will read a document and say, we don't even know what Target 1 wants us to do, what Target 2 wants us to do, Target 3. So back at the national level, we shall have to make sure that we clarify on the roles of the different stakeholders. The alignment we have had should happen in perhaps less than one year, if possible. One year max, because already we have lost two years. This framework was supposed to be there in 2020. Now this is 2022. Two years have gone. You took alignment, it's another one year gone, and, and soon you are thinking of 2030. So that's why the speedy part of implementation is being up. Otherwise, you'll find ourselves talking about, again, looking at this framework, yeah? trying to refine it again. So there is a lot that will need to be done at the national level, bringing all stakeholders. I have to give you an example at this point in time, maybe I take off the heart of the culture, but what happened in Uganda when the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011, 2020 was adopted, and then countries were required to align their NBSAPs to the IHE targets. What we did in Uganda was to invite all stakeholders, whether they are finance people, whether they are lawyers, whether they are scientists, whether they are academicians, because biodiversity is about everyone and trying to make them understand, first of all, what are these IHE targets and how can they be domesticated, which national government entity will take responsibility on which target. And if you are agreeing at the national level target, aligning it to the global one, is it something that the other entity finds they can actually implement? So the national targets for Uganda, each of those entities were the ones that said, well, with the target on protected areas, yes, we think we can go with this, or we think we could go with this. So those are the things that we need to do it, and very fast this time around, maybe in one year, and then we go ahead with the implementation. But the other part, which has been said, I could only say it for emphasis, is on the resources for implementation. This needs to be there. Otherwise, we shall talk. We shall talk. As they now know us, we talk a lot. We don't implement. And then people are asking, but Francis, with your framework, where is it? And you don't have a direct answer. So resources for implementation. And lastly, this is the other thing that happened in or for the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020 is that we first adopted the framework and started developing the monitoring indicators later. That took six years. It was adopted in 2016. I think it was in Mexico. Now, what, how were we monitoring, meanwhile, progress? So this time round, indicators are being developed at the same time. So that once we adopt the framework, the monitoring indicators, at least the headline indicators are there, and parties can start straight away with uh, monitoring progress of implementation. So there are quite a number things that needs to be done for sure to enhance speed implementation but the lessons learned from the previous strategic plan is why now we have decided to try to do things different this time thank you great thank you very very much yeah that question of indicators has been crucial uh, and it's been identified as being a real issue so now as part of the negotiations the various working groups around it a very detailed monitoring and indicator framework is currently being developed that's important um, I'm going to move now, I'm, I'm taking the questions in a different order. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, stakeholders, and we've already got some comments on that now, but I'm going to move to that, because one of the things that's distinctive about the global biodiversity framework from the previous work under the convention is that it really is meant to be a global framework for all. So we've got the representation of the, uh, the MEAs and the United Nations system here as well, but the circle for this framework is larger than that. It's meant to encompass a whole variety of other actors, so we're meant to bring in the business sector the finance sector. We're meant to really engage the different productive sectors as well, so agriculture, forestry, but expanding into areas like the health sector, those who work in infrastructure, industry, etc. And then, of course, ensuring that we've got a broad engagement with civil society, with indigenous peoples and local communities, women and youth as well. So this is an important part of it. So our next round of conversation here is going to be about, indeed, this mobilization here. So... 
when I you know invite you to speak here from the the stage is can we talk a little bit about how stakeholders um, you know including those in national governments but beyond that as well how can they contribute to the framework successful implementation um, can we also look at how, what the knowledge of IPLCs indigenous peoples and local communities can be mobilized and then also the UN system entities you know can you speak to us about how you can assist or mobilize or bring in stakeholders. We've heard a little bit about that already, but we'll hear more of it. Uh, and again, I'll give the floor to Elizabeth to start this whole question about stakeholder engagement and the whole of society. Thank you, David. Clearly, stakeholder engagement is key to the success of the framework. And especially, you have mentioned indigenous peoples, local communities. We all know 80% of sustainable uh, or areas where biodiversity has been sustainably managed or restored are the areas managed by local communities who only occupy 5% of this world space. But 80% of sustained conservation areas are in their areas. So those are key. One of the key lessons we also learned from the failure of the Aichi biodiversity target was the non adequate engagement of the stakeholders. There was that assumption that the IT targets were the responsibility of governments, uh, also for implementation, and the rest of us who stayed at bay waiting for things to happen. But biodiversity cut across all borders. And now we are talking of whole of society, whole of government, whole ends on deck uh, when it comes to implementation, meaning that all of us, including you in this room and myself, will need to contribute to the success of that framework if we have to succeed. During this process, and co-chairs might correct me if I'm wrong, but the co-chairs have succeeded to engage literally each and every stakeholder we have in, this, in, uh, in society. I really want to know which network of stakeholders has not been engaged. Be bankers, be financial, other financial institutions, business, youth, women, civil society, researchers, you name it. And uh, fortunately, unfortunately, the COVID period gave them this extended period to do so. so. And the results of that is that literally all stakeholders can see themselves in the draft framework. That will not have happened if not through their engagement and that now they are seeing themselves. But seeing themselves there is not only for decoration. Clearly indicates they will be expected to contribute and play a role in the implementation of the framework uh, when it is finally adopted because each stakeholder contributes differently depending on their mandates, depending on their focus, and those will be the bits and pieces which will add into uh, what will have the final review or ongoing review of how we'll be faring. So all stakeholders have been engaged, and not only engaged, fortunately in the CBD process, when stakeholder takes the floor and make recommendation, it only needs one party to endorse that recommendation is taken on board. It's not one third or two third or half, just one party to say yes, I endorse or I uh, agree with that recommendation is taken on board. So it's not so much of an effort that you need so many parties to agree to that recommendation. And probably that has also facilitated that contribution of stakeholders into the draft framework. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So as she said, the, the, the framework is very radical in its, its engagement. Um, I'm going to turn to the, the other MEAs right now to start on this question. We'll start with, 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 uh, with, with Donald. You know, what sort of stakeholder engagement, what advice can you give us in terms of engaging stakeholders and making a broad representation as we move forward in this framework? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the UNFCCC process has many um, stakeholder groups, even amongst the parties. In fact, uh, the representation amongst parties is very rarely on regional grounds, but on groups of countries who 
have uh, things in common when it comes to climate. This encouragement also applied outside of the government sector to virtually every stakeholder group. Um, anything or any group you can name, they have representation and they have a formalized uh, uh, entry point into the process. Um, I did a, um, a presentation with you and uh, was asked a question about uh, um, the disability groups. And uh, that made me think. And that was the first time I'd actually come across a group who did not have formal representation in our process. And I immediately encouraged her um, to seek to do so because um, the, the tent is very, very broad. And every single contribution, no matter how small or big, is valuable and needed. So we strongly urge that you reflect this um, in the agreement and look for better ways than we have found so far of making sure that all of those views are represented. Um, it is fantastic to get all of the groups in. Then you've got to figure out how do you get the views um, into the main um, debate area of the process. Remember that governments are very proprietary about negotiating with governments. So you have to look carefully at these are the negotiation of the legally binding agreement, and these are the discussions on the implementation and use of it. Governments are not so particular about the implementation and use because it's for everybody. So we have found that it is hugely beneficial um, to have non-party stakeholder engagement to establish forum for this, to give them strong roles, to give them opportunities to demonstrate um, how they are working, even if it's just to brag about the successes they're having. All of that um, enhances the process and shows everyone that success breeds success. So we strongly urge that this become a huge plank and you find ways of bringing them on board. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the advice. And certainly, I do, we do see this in, in incredible range of engagement with stakeholders under your process. So, uh, uh, Louise Baker, you talked a little bit already about the engagement with stakeholders under the process of the UNCCD. Um, you know, are there stakeholder engagement mechanisms you have that would feed into our framework? But also, how would you advise us on engaging with stakeholders as well? Well, I hate being put under that kind of question. I'm not sure we can provide you much advice on this. I think we're still, and I think it's a really important lesson, I think that we, we're probably there, that um, you're absolutely right, the proprietary nature of the, of the countries in terms of owning the negotiations, I think it requires uh, the countries and also the, the secretariats to, to kind of give up a little bit of control to a certain extent. Oh, sorry, to give up a little bit of control in terms of the process, and that's quite difficult. I think everybody's sort of n nudging in that direction. For us, I think probably the one thing that I think that I think has been successful for us has been the target around land degradation neutrality was negotiated and the indicators were negotiated incredibly formally. But the, uh, we, we were involved in setting up a private sector fund, an impact investment fund. And what they've done, which I've really appreciated, is translate the processes, um, the, the kind of intergovernmental processes, into something that works for the private sector. So translating those targets into what it really means for, for project implementation in the private sector. And that's been something that's been really helpful and has, has gained traction. But I think. Can we come with you and can we, can we learn with you on how to engage them together? Thank you. Okay, so it's lessons. We're all moving together in this one. So Su Susan Gardner, I mean, UNEP has got an extensive engagement across a variety of issues. Is what can you, uh, in what ways would you be able to support more engagement with different stakeholders for the GBF, but then also any lessons that you have to tell us as well? We've heard a lot of really good examples already from the panel. Um, you know, I would just add a couple more in terms of what we've done with the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Right at the very beginning of that process, before even beginning the process of identifying flagship programs and things like that, is we really reached out 
We did surveys. We tried to understand where were biodiversity hotspots, how was the community involved, what were the best practices, and tried to share information across communities in terms of what works at the local level. Um, so looking at those efforts that were made as part of the decade on ecosystem restoration helps provide an indication of uh, so, good, so good approaches, um, but also helps to emphasize how important it is that the local community has the buy-in, that they're part of the solution. Um, and I agree that ensuring that there's not only the buy-in, but the empowerment of the local community. So for example, do you have, does a country have the right land rights and inheritance laws in place to protect women who may be have the bulk of the responsibility as stewards of the land and the protection of the biodiversity. Um, is there enough public awareness of the, of the benefits, the local benefits from these actions so that you get the local community engaged? Um, we're also seeing that as consumers are more aware, as they have options, as they understand the impacts of their choices, they're much more likely to be willing to be disadvantaged to be inconvenienced, to be disadvantaged in terms of helping contribute to a bigger goal. And so that kind of public awareness and information, engaging local community that can, is all part of how it works best. And one model that I really enjoyed was from the UN Food Systems Summit Food System Dialogues, where there was over 100 different national dialogues that took place. Um, and yes, it's about releasing control, it's true, and the countries that stepped forward and said they were willing to do these national dialogues were very courageous in saying that we're okay to bring all of the different stakeholders together and let's see what happens. And the conversations were fascinating. We heard farmers talking with larger industry, talking with government officials and NGOs, and all they went into small virtual breakout rooms and there was constructive, solution-oriented conversations where people were authentic about, here are my needs, here's what my problems are that I'm dealing with today. And someone else said, you know, I never really saw it from that perspective. So I think that as much as it's hard to do in these MEA processes, uh, the payoff is enormous. Great, thank you very, very much. So these are some important lessons. So now I'm gonna turn to the co-chairs who have spent so much of their time already engaging, um, nourishing this engagement with stakeholders. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what your experience has been so far and some of the things we should take forward and reflect on the, the comments we've received from our panelists. Thanks. I'll, I'll make a confidence. I don't think Francis and, our, and I are very smart. <laughs> but we do listen. And we do listen to stakeholders because they are smart. And, and actually, our job is to listen and assemble the, the piece coming from the stakeholders. I think, I think it, you know, what we see, the reason why we engage to stakeholders is not because it's something nice to do that Elizabeth is happy that we do. It is something that parties have tell us in terms of finding the best solution. If, if we're looking for the best language to figure out how we can deal with a target on pollution, and particularly if we deal with uh, pesticides and nutrients, well, we better talk to people that know about that and, and listen carefully to what they're telling us in terms of focusing on risk and focusing on impacts, et cetera, and what could be reasonable numbers. And, and it's wonderful to engage with, with every uh, corner of civil society business and, and engage with them. And that has, I think, brought a, a text that is, is better. So I won't talk about smartness anymore, but turn to Francis. Yeah, thank you, Koche. Um, I think one of the other factors that can also help us with uh, speeding up or enhancing implementation involving stakeholders is to do what I will call here stakeholder mapping. You see, you are talking about a framework that is for all. It is very important that before you start implementation that you have identified those stakeholders at the national level, for example, early enough 
do not start implementation then somewhere after two years you say we did include stakeholder X, Y, Z and therefore you need to go back. If these IPLCs, don't bring them in the middle. Bring them right from the beginning. So stakeholder mapping is the first thing that you need to do that. So stakeholder engagement, they will tell you, you've listed this but you've forgotten this one at national level. The other one is we need very strong focal points at the national level. They are the authority on the framework. The co-chairs cannot be the ones, again, to become focal points at the national level. So if we have strong focal points who have understood the framework, and that's why participation at this point in time is very, very critical, because you need them now to be your disciples back at the national level. So we are building up that team that should help us to enhance implementation at national level. But they must understand the subject matter. They must be able to explain. If they can't, then there is a weakness somewhere. The other one is about partnership. You cannot implement this framework for all alone. It could be global, it could be regional, it could be national. You need to do partnership at whatever level it takes. You could be the private sector, could be partnership with the NGO, could be partnership with academia. Could it, you, know, you need to think through how you are going to you know, um, implement this framework. So innovativeness is the other bit that people need to, be, to think through. Business as usual, we have said, will not take us far. So people have to think a lot when it comes to implementation. I think even partnership comes along with the networking. So those are some of the ways in which we think if people can think through, then we could enhance implementation. But honestly, implementation is just going to be the start of another difficult journey. We have to prepare our mindset for that. Right now, it is framework being concluded. Immediately after that, what next? And this is why I think we are talking of what needs to be done. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So now we have the opportunity for those of you who are here uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, to ask questions of the panel. So I'm hoping we've got a microphone here that we can circulate. Um, when you ask your question, introduce who you are, your organization, uh, and then uh, indicate who you direct your question to. So we have a question over here on this side. Do we have a microphone? Side event organizers, do we have a microphone? Great, thank you very much. I'm uh, from Japan and uh, for full disclosure, I'm deeply engaged in the TNFD framework uh, development as task force alternate member. But my question is a little bit different from that type of thing. It's about the deep sea bed. Because deep sea bed probably provide minerals which are indispensable for decarbonization economy, or deep sea bed can play a huge role to sequestration or storage of sequestered CO2 from air, like duck, but also we don't have any scientific data what kind of influence this kind of business activity would cause. But so far, we don't have any particular convention or any particular UN forum which could control business activity on the seabed side. So probably 10 years later, we could have, but we cannot wait for that kind of scheme would happen. So how can CBD and UNF2CCC work on that in collaboration to avoid serious damage, but also to leave a potentiality for decarbonization economy. Great, thank you very much. Oh, Basil said he was going to, well, so Basil will answer, but then I may turn to uh, Donald and then Elizabeth to look at the two. But Basil, you go ahead and start, please. I'll give you some, some high level points. So there is, uh, if you look at uh, one of the targets in the proposed framework, target 14 include a requirement for environmental assessment. And that is, in my experience, environmental in impact assessment has been a very important policy tool across the board to look at, at uh, how any activity is taking place on the landscape 
can, can impact that landscape. Another element of the framework that is useful is target one with the, the uh, possibility of or the requirement to have uh, land and seascape planning. So you heard about 30 by 30 and the protection of 30, you know, people are, are proposing protection of a certain portion of the landscape. What is really important at the end of the day is what you do with the 70%, the other part. There will be some mine, there will be uh, cities, there will be area for many, many different uh, uh, utilization. What is important is to have a planning process that take into consideration biodiversity uh, elements into making those decisions. So you shift the discussion from let me tell you what you should not be doing at place X to a discussion about how we have a landscape and how do we use that land or skiscape where would we put a protected area? What are the areas that are important for migration or whatever? And, and what are the areas where some economic activity can take place? So you get several elements in the framework that can help you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Donald, do you wanna? Yes, um, I think that's a, a very valuable point. Um, the objective is not to go from one extreme where you are not protecting the biodiversity to the other extreme where you're excluding everything else. It's, it's find where the harmony is. And um, at the moment, under the uh, um, Climate Change Convention, there's a huge momentum on blue carbon uh, because they are recognizing the value of the blue carbon as a sink whether that's in the shallow waters with the marine zones or whether that's um, deeper, um, this is considered a hugely valuable resource. Um, the, um, we're talking you know, trillions of dollars at that level, where a small island country can be thinking billions of dollars a year towards their national development in a better way. Right? So um, the actions will not wait for an agreement. That is one of the good things. If you want to take advantage, they're going to take advantage now, long before there is any agreement to, to manage those resources, simply because it is in the best interest of the country. And one of the things we have found that makes things happen quickly is to structure it in a way that it is within the best interest of the country. And very often, um, that is surprisingly easy to do because the actions you're proposing are very beneficial socially, economically, as well as financially. Thank you. Thanks. Francis, you wanted to make a comment. Go ahead. Yes, uh, just to add a, a, bit to, a little bit to what colleagues have said. Um, of course, the deep sea, you would say, is also part of an ecosystem. And um, the CBD itself has got a lot of provisions that covers a broad range of ecosystems. This could be one of them. And um, Koshia talked about the environmental impact assessment. It is there also in the text of that convention. But something also I needed to add is that I think national level legislation needs to be implemented. Often these laws are there, but they are not implemented. Actually, it is not, this minding is not, not only on deep seas, even rivers, lakes, name them. There are people now extracting minerals, they are sand because it seems they, their value is much higher now and is becoming a global community. So national level law implementation is a big challenge in most cases. If that can be done, we could as well, even if this international, there's no international treaty on this, we could save the situation. It is just laxity at the national level sometimes making these situations worse. Thank you, Francis. We have another question from the floor. We have several. Okay, so first, we've got one of the mic. Good? Yeah. Um, no, thank you. I can see smiles on the panel. Um, so <laughs> wonderful to see everybody. So my name is Renata Nirai, and I do know many of you already because I engage with the UNCBD and also very much engaged with the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. So first, congratulations, you've come so far, and I'm really excited about the COP15. Um, and also, I'm really happy to have seen the Biodiversity Day celebrated yesterday, but also very high level messaging and around it. So my main question is um, to everybody. Uh, so 
the we are here at the cup 27 and how what you're talking about is the essence which i see a bit missing you know talking about the links with uh with climate change and the biodiversity talking about land rivers mountains and i wonder whether in the in in this uh meeting whether we have seen that um enough uh, value of the importance of linking uh, the nexus between biodiversity and climate. I I'm just giving an example, right? Like say for example, it's been seen as nature for climate action, but how about nature for living in harmony? But we always talk about CBD, right? Living in harmony with nature, which evolves around culture and evolves around different ecosystems. In the, in the draft, in the, in the um, Cover documents is my first time at the climate, so I don't know how the work. But say, for example, in the, in the um, cover decision, it talks about biodiversity for, for conserving of nature, uh, restoration and conservation for uh, climate action. But it misses out saying that, you know, we really need to do uh, conservation and restoration of nature to also ensure that we halt biodiversity loss. Because we have this framework, it's so instrumental, and I think whatever being commitments are being there, the whole crust of it is going to be coming to what the GBF is going to be adopted. The essence of it is there, like you talked about, target one, target three, target eight, target 15, target 20, 21, 22, and gender equality. So it'll have this dominoes effect. So I'm just saying that, do you see that it's being, um, both the post-2020 ambition is, is also being as much being taken on board in the COP27. Thanks very much. <coughs> Put it to the panelists. Who wants to, who wants to take that one up? Susan, go ahead. Well, I appreciate your comment very much. And I would just point to the recent decision by member states that uh, was adopted at the UN Environment Assembly uh, earlier this year, where they agreed to a clear definition of nature-based solutions and it was really important that it included benefits for nature as well as benefits for humans. And it is so important that when we're talking about investments and activities to restore, preserve, or manage well nature, that it's about human well-being, it's about economic growth, it's about sustainable development, it's about nature, it's about biodiversity, it's about health, water, so I think what the, you know, you're asking if there's a solution. I think the solution is that you keep asking that question. You keep reminding uh, everyone that this is all of these benefits that come together is the reason why this has to be prioritized. We have to meet these targets. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Francis, do you want to have a quick word? And we'll go to another question after that. Yes, um, I had, if I got the summary of the observation correct, is do we think there is enough, enough linkage uh, being created? Well, I think let's appreciate that at least now this COP is beginning to bring on board biodiversity issues. I think in the past it was glaringly missing. Now you see it is progressively coming. I think we, we need to be working together and see how we keep addressing those gaps. Um, if they are mentioning that this is for climate action, would it be possible to include for climate action and biodiversity conservation? Th those are things I think it needs engagement, people to understand things. But I think the, the indicators are there that these linkages are going to get stronger with time. In fact, by the time we started this uh, process way back in 2019, we kept hearing from the regions that they want where climate action is, biodiversity action should also be there. In other words, there should be synergy between these, including, of course, the one on uh, land degradation, the, UN, the CCD. So before we have actually adopted the framework, we already see this is happening. So we could say that I think as co-chairs, that message you people kept passing, we are beginning to see it happen. And I think as we implement now the framework itself, we need to create these synergies with UNFCCC and the CCD is much stronger and see how these three can actually better be implemented. Because in 1992, I think the world realized that, that those were the three critical areas 
that we needed global community to take action on. Climate change, biodiversity loss, land degradation. And I think opportunity will be there. I think the, the action has now started. Let's not lose hope in it. Let's give it more strength and momentum. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Question up front here. Go ahead. Thank you very much for a fascinating panel and discussion and for the engaging method as well, which is perfect for a conversation about stakeholders. And I particularly appreciated the points that were being made about engaging with different constituencies that can help and want to help. Um, I'm Professor Marie-Claire Cordonier-Seger, and here in the COP, I chair, I've been executive secretary of the Climate Law and Governance Initiative since 2005. Actually, since the 11th meeting of the COP in Montreal. And you'll probably guess where I'm going with this already. So, um, we actually bring together uh, law and governance actors, not just general counsel of international organizations and law directors, but also um, law professors, judges, jurists, private practitioners, a lot of those who are now involved in climate litigation uh, worldwide and meet every year with a Climate Law and Governance Day that this year re attracted 1,400 registrants, co-chaired by the host from last year, Glasgow, and the host from this year, um, Ayn Shams University in Cairo. There's a pre-conference and a set of events. There's a Climate Law and Governance Day during the COP. It's always the first Friday. And then there's a course that is taught on the weekend for any junior delegates or observers. We had 420 people registering this time. I think we need one of these for the biodiversity COP. And I think that it's a possibility to jump forward, take up the challenge you've issued to those of us who are involved. And I can't see anyone involved in the Climate Law and Governance Initiative as it's grown over the years objecting. I think rather there will be open arms not just because um, of the leaders of the biodiversity conventions engagement in these issues, but also because during the Climate Law and Governance Day, there were sessions on nature-based solutions all the way through. And biodiversity took a highlight role alongside climate law as one of the ways that we had to work together. It would only be fair to switch that back in the other direction and make sure that we do climate and biodiversity sessions in a biodiversity law and governance day in Montreal. I'll contact my colleagues at Mingle Law Faculty. We would love to see you there on the Saturday maybe in between week one and week two. And maybe we can also hold biodiversity law and governance awards like we just gave the climate law and governance awards for the fourth year running. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I think we'll take that under advisement consideration. Basil, do you want to make a comment? And we'll take one more question from the gentleman in the back who's raised his hand there. So go ahead, Basil. I will tell you a story. Uh, the, uh, there is an initiative uh, sponsored by several parties that train uh, female francophone negotiators. And I've always been looking at that and said, can we do the same for biodiversity? And then there was discussion, etc. And then finally, I was invited to talk to the uh, climate negotiator training. And in the end, this was the solution. It was not about replicating side by side. It was about integrating biodiversity and climate at the training level with the same people that will be present anyway in the, in the same. So that's the point to you, Marie Claire. It's often we're going to see the same people. And how can we integrate that training so that it is it is one and not two side by side. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Let's squeeze in this last question. I'm pushing the limit here. I want to go right to the end. Please go ahead, introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. I am Joshua Aita and I'm from Uganda. So at the IUCN Africa Protected Areas Congress, one of the resolutions from the Kigali Call to Action saw that it was important to connect the biodiversity and the climate crisis. And also in Africa, it's just about 7% of the whole continent that's under protected area cover. But then by 2030, we are talking of the 30 by 30 target. That's one area I'm more interested in, the area-based conservation. So we are also pushing for rights-based approaches to conservation. And uh, that one of, the, one of the avenues we would have to explore is through the OACMs 
And uh, I'm so much curious to know about the safeguards that are, that are already in place for OACMs because we already have issues arising about the 30 by 30 target. And of course, there are also propositions that the 30 by 30 target is just a minimum that perhaps we could actually even look at going up to 50, that's uh, protect, protecting up to, up, up to half of the earth. So my curiosity is just about the safeguards that are in place already for OECMs and how effective will they be in terms of monitoring and implementation at uh, national levels. Thank you. Great, thank you very, very much. I think that's something for the co-chairs, I think, definitely. Sorry, we'll put you on the spot there for that. But indeed, it, this is an important issue under the question of 30 by 30, the role of OECMs, rights-based approaches, uh, and indeed this thresholds as well. Go ahead. Somehow my, my Ugandan co-chair asked me to respond. <laughs> <laughs> I, we're going back to the whole of the landscape. And, and then basically, when you look at, at uh, the portfolio of uh, conservation tool, it is only natural when you look at a landscape that you have a very uh, high level of protection. You know, there may be, in my country, there is place where not even human allowed. They're, they're, they're wildlife reserve. And you go all, through all the spectrum, all the way to national parks and, and place where people can enjoy recreational. And there is that notion that there is a number of landscape pieces where there is an, uh, an activity that takes place, but there is a biodiversity benefit. Um, in, in, in a number of countries, low density ranching that mimic the presence of uh, natural species is leading to benefit from a bird perspective. So you can imagine a number of combinations. And um, the, the key piece, I think, is at the national level to enter into a dialogue with all stakeholders to have definition of what is acceptable or not, the process, the accounting, the governance. And that, has, that is not only leading to biodiversity results, but it can also lead to social results in terms of engagement of local uh, communities and indigenous people. So that, that could be an opportunity that goes well beyond biodiversity. Thank you. Let me just add to, to, to my coaches and thank you, uh, my friend there from Uganda about ra raising some of this. I didn't want to start first because uh, you needed to hear from my co-chair and then I add on to it. Now, First, the, the, the target 30 by 30 is still under discussion, eh? so the, it might change, the, the text may change a lot. We may not have to discuss it in detail at this point in time. But in the case of Uganda, some of the safeguards that one would think could help is the National Environment Act 2019. If you read it, there's a section that deals with the special conservation areas. These are areas outside protected areas that government could decide to, you know, gazette either as important conservation area. Already the Kalagala Itanda uh, offset area was gazetted by parliament in 2019, just taking on this provision. So once we are operating with the OCMs, the provision of that act is something that we can use to operationalize the OCM in Uganda. So that is, I would call it the comfort you have. The law is already there and it, it puts in a number of things that you must take into account when setting these uh, special conservation areas. We have, we have not called it OCM, but we have called it special conservation areas in the context of Uganda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We've hit our time. In fact, we've actually gone over time. I want to thank all of our panelists for their engagement and their creative uh, and really constructive contributions to this discussion. And I'm looking forward to this being part of action and implementation on the road uh, going forward. I want to thank all of you who stayed here for the event, uh, uh, for your questions, and for your continued engagement on all of these agendas, the climate and biodiversity agendas, and then also the agenda for land degradation, the SDGs. So thank you very much. Let's continue to work. And I hope we see most of you in Montreal. Thanks very much.